Thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Atomic Red Team's Proving Grounds. My name is Kia and I'll be your moderator. Today's presentation is from Red Canary's Applied Research Team, Casey Smith and Michael Hay. The Atomic Red Team developed tests to help organizations immediately start testing their defenses. Their open source collection is comprised of small, highly portable tests. They're flexible to allow for organizations to customize testing and coverage in respective network environments. In today's training session, you'll learn how to take your atomic testing to the proving grounds by building chain reactions by combining multiple minor attack techniques and executing them simultaneously, customize sequences based on your specific attack surface and threat risks, Use carbon black telemetry to create detections and measure detection tools and expose gaps. And with that, I'll hand it over to Casey Smith and Michael Haig. Great, thanks, Kia. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, I think Kia mentioned earlier that uh, we're going to be talking about going to the proving grounds today. So the idea of a proving grounds comes from the atomic test ranges in New Mexico. Uh, the idea here was how, what's a place where you can go and test a theory or a piece of equipment or hardware. So that's the idea here is how do we use the Atomic Red Team tools to test your endpoint detection solutions? And we're going to focus on using Carbon Black today. Uh, I think you'll really like what you're going to see. So, Okay, as Kia mentioned, my name is Casey Smith. I'm the Director of Applied Research here at Red Canary. You can connect with me on Twitter at SubT. I'll let Mike go ahead and introduce himself. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Kia. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Michael Haig. I'm a director of advanced threat detection and research here at Red Canary, and you can follow me on Twitter as well, m underscore Haggis. So, a quick overview. We got a, like Casey mentioned, a lot of ground to cover here today. Uh, to begin, we're going to go through just a little bit about Atomic Red Team again. Uh, probably most everyone on here is seeing a lot about it or seeing it on Twitter, the blog. Uh, then we're going to jump into chain reactions. Uh, look at uh, detonating and detecting it. Uh, so there's a lot to go on. This is going to be a very fun webinar, and feel free to ask questions as you uh, as you start to see here. Awesome. So just some quick background on why we created the Atomic. I know there's a lot of people that are at different points uh, joining the webinar. We've got some resources for previous webinars that we've actually done. So if you're curious, you could backtrack and, and catch one of our earlier talks on. Uh, sort of the origin and why we created Atomic Red Team. Uh, in a nutshell, the idea is we wanted people to test their solutions effectively. We saw people that were testing uh, solutions with not the best practices. So uh, a couple of things we'll, we'll go through today that we think are the best ways to test endpoint telemetry. Uh, other places you can find things. So the Atomic Red Team is on GitHub. Uh, there's a link that I think uh, will be pasted in the chat here in a bit. So you can go if you want to download and look at any of our code as we go through these. And then also reference to the MITRE framework, uh, the attack framework, which is, again, not ours, but we use our, we model our uh, tests on the Atomic, or, or, I'm sorry, off the MITRE uh, techniques. So, okay. So today we're going to do a chain reaction. So Mike and I key off the, the word atomic. We use a lot of atomic imagery from the 40s and 50s. The real idea here is how do you create small, discrete tests that we can actually use in our environment? So the, the word atomic really is, is the smallest unit of test rather than actual atomic <laughs> components. And then we're going to detonate these and then build the detections with carbon black. And Mike will be taking you through that. So we think it's really important that as you run these tests, you're validating that your able to see the telemetry. And the idea here for these tests is you don't have to wait for a red team to show up to make sure that your solutions are collecting information. You can test these iteratively or often, as often as you like. We've created a couple different chain reactions. You can see we kind of key off the atomic theme there, but today we're gonna be going over the one at the bottom, which is called reactor. And I'll take you through all the different components, but these are just open source uh, examples of, of combining techniques that you can run, and you're welcome to check these out on our GitHub page. So what we're gonna cover today is uh, from the MITRE ATT&CK framework, if you're not familiar with the ATT&CK framework, it, it is the taxonomy or classes of ATT&CK, so it stands for uh, Attacker Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. And so we've got a couple of different components here where we're gonna go through like the discovery component, where how does an attacker figure out where they are on a box? How do they then use credentials to move through your network? 
how do they discover or look for software that may be running? So it's very common for an attacker to profile your system before they begin any movement to see what security software may be in play. And then we'll look at things like collection and exfiltration. So again, a huge thanks to Miter for putting this framework together. Uh, you can see the different techniques or tactics rather on the right hand side there of the screen. These are the things that we would think are important in our test map to those. With that, like we said, we've got a lot to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into some hands on um, detonation of different techniques. So first of all, we're going to look at discovery, then credential access, discovery execution, collection and exfiltration. If you have questions as we go through this, I'll pause at the end of this to answer any questions. So just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. All right, so you should be seeing uh, the Git repo here uh, on my test system. And you can see if we just simply clone or download the repo, I've copied all of this locally to my machine. Again, always make sure when you're running these tests, you have permission to run the tests and that you're doing it in an environment that's instrumented so that your tests can be detected. So. With that, uh, this particular reactor chain reaction lives in the artifacts folder, chain reactions, and then we have the reactor. So uh, this is really designed to be run as a batch file. I'm gonna take you through line by line and, and show you how this works, but really in order to mimic the velocity of an, of an actor, uh, you wanna run this all at once. And so that's what is designed here. So you might see some minor variations between my code and the code that's in the repo just for this webinar, but otherwise uh, this should be something you could download and execute pretty easily. So I'm just in a basic notepad editor here. I'm gonna take you through uh, the different components. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the technique known as system owner and discover and user discovery. And just to bring that up real quick, so you can have a reference for that. This is the technique on the minor page. So the, again, we didn't create these. We just want to say, well, how would you actually test if an adversary was conducting this particular technique? And so there's a lot of different things that attackers will do. One of the things they have to do is figure out who they are and what they have access to in your environment. And that's really what's happening in this chain reaction. At the very first phase, we're going to use a tool here called QWinsta, uh, which is a default binary in Windows and it's very common for attackers to do their recon or enumeration of accounts using local tools, PowerShell, QWinsta, QUser. We'll look at a couple different examples. But if you were to just simply run QWinsta from a command prompt, you can see it's going to output a couple of different things on the screen. And I can see that in this particular server or workstation, there's a user account called research that's actively logged in. Now, as an attacker, what we might want to do is run that. Let's say maybe we landed on a, uh, a terminal server that has multiple accounts connected to it. We may want to run this and pipe everything out into a folder called, or a file called usernames. So we harvest the different names, drop them into this username text file that we're going to then use later. So one of the things that's actually not often talked about with this particular tool is the ability for this tool to connect to and enumerate remote systems. So let me just drop this in here. So I just copied the command as another example. And let's say we've identified either through Active Directory or through some other technique, a server on our network called Server 2016. Um, we can actually run QWinsta and it will go out and find that server. And we're just scraping out the username as the extra code that you see in here. We're looking for you know, active accounts piping that to the user text file. If we then look at the username file, we've got two in there. I already ran this earlier, so you can see it just concatenated that. I'll go ahead and just change that just for this test later on. So, But you get the idea. This The thing that's interesting here is this is not a domain joined account. So we're actually able to enumerate systems on the network without even being a part of the domain with QW and stuff. So that's kind of fun. Uh, so anyway, all right. So we've enumerated accounts. You could also do this. Uh, Mike wrote some really cool um, loops in here. So you can actually take a list of computer names, pipe that into this command, and then run QWINSTA or QWINSTA for each uh, computer in that text file. And that'd just be a really basic flat text file. You could also do this in memory with PowerShell or other loops. There's a lot of different techniques, but those are some of the basic ideas for 
user enumeration. So the idea is we want to figure out who we are and what other systems we have access to using this built-in tool inside of Windows. And so that's one way that an attacker might be able to discover different accounts. Another technique, and this is just to show you a couple of variations that you guys are welcome to use. Uh, with PowerShell, you could do a very simple script. Again, we're going to still be running QWINSDA, but we may want to run this in PowerShell and parse out the objects and use objects and properties. Uh, so that might look something like this, just as a, a you know an alternate ending or a variation on that. We we'll create the function. We simply run QWINSDA against server 2016. It should come back here in a minute with the different components, uh, different properties. So. Again, that's just a parameter on the command line for PowerShell. So there it comes back. It says, okay, on server 2016, we have a user currently logged in called test that's active. And then we could then pivot off of that. So there's a couple different ways you could do this. We just wanted to show you the very simple way, which is a batch file with a loop. Feel free to pivot and use these techniques in any way that's possible. So, okay. So that's the first tech tactic and technique, which is discovery and then system owner and user discovery using QWI and SCA. Now, let's take what we've learned and go try and attack some systems. So a common technique here, there's two techniques you can see on line 21 and 22. You can actually see we're gonna do a brute force attack and we're going to be looking at Windows admin shares. So just to show you again where these map back to, Brute force is defined here in all of our repo points back to if you're looking for additional information about a technique, really the catalog and authority or system of record is the MITRE framework for these. And then here's Windows admin shares. So you're probably familiar Windows has shares like C dollar sign, IPC dollar sign, and that's what we're going to use to connect. So in this atomic test, the first line, again, keep in mind, it's designed to be all run at once. We pipe out the names of the users. We also then take the input of the usernames and we have a password file that we're going to use as input to brute force these accounts. So really basic. I mean, our password list is just very simple for this webinar. We've got winter 2018 and then the company name 2018. And so for each user in that list, we would try each of these passwords. A couple things you may observe or be thinking about is you could absolutely lock accounts out if you're not careful. So that's up to you and knowing the environment that you're testing. So just make sure you're, again, using accounts um, that you're not gonna disrupt production when you run these tests, but we can just go ahead and copy this here. It'll take just a minute to run this test. And I'll just drop it in here. And what it's gonna try then is each user account, and if it finds a match, it should print out on the line that, hey, we found a match with this user and this test, boom, test winter 2018. So um, pretty easy to see, but you get the idea. We could test individual accounts or we could test multiple passwords, use more complex password lists. Very common iterations for passwords are like first characters, uppercase, last character is a symbol. So, you know, uppercase and then iterate through and change the password list. But we, we successfully mapped a drive to the IPC share on server 2016. And now we know that we've got a good set of credentials. Not every attacker is going to use brute force in their environment. So they may use credential dumping tools or other techniques. But again, we're just trying to highlight a couple of combined techniques to do brute force and then a Windows admin share. So that's really the second uh, detonation. Now we're going to move into the third, which is going to be security software discovery. This is absolutely a technique that people will use before they make any move on the machine, they're going to look at what software is installed. And so in this example, we land on a box. We're gonna look at firewall rules, which may be important to see which processes are firewalls from making internet connections. So you may want to inject or move into a process that has permission, for example. Also, we're able to do a task list and then look for these strings inside of our process list. So for example, we know this box is instrumented with for uh, carbon black for the sake of our lab. So a very quick technique would be go ahead and run a process list and find out if CB is running. It is, and we can see the process ID. And so now an attacker may change or vary their techniques based on what they find. You could look for other keywords 
uh, any antivirus or Windows Defender or any other products that may be out there. Very common technique. You may change those to match your environment. Uh, there's other techniques. Certainly, there's other ways to list processes. If they're in PowerShell, they may be using Git Process and filtering that way. Uh, they may actually be using a tool like FLTMC. There's a couple different things that like attackers can use to figure out maybe what tools. But you get the idea. Here's a basic test. We're going to run task list, enumerate processes, and just find matching names. Pretty straightforward. All right, the next one is then uh, going to be using execution and discovery. So here we're going to be running a PowerShell technique. And inside of the PowerShell string, we're going to be downloading a batch file that's called discovery.bat. And so rather than run that right away, you can see we're calling invoke expression inside of PowerShell. We're creating, this is like a, you know, cookie cutter uh, download cradle that attackers will use. So PowerShell making a netcon to GitHub, pulling down the file and executing it. So what's in that file? Again, you can see in the repo, if you download it, we've got a file called uh, discovery.bat. And there's a number of different techniques that you can run through here to do things like enumerate all the uh, local accounts, administrative accounts, interesting registry keys that are there, using WMI to do some enumeration of processes and shares. You can also see we're running like things like who am I, IP config. And Michael will take you through the technique of or detecting these techniques in just a moment. But this gives you a pretty good feel of like what an attacker might be doing. And if you see these uh, uh, commands being run in a quick interval, it may be an indicator of attacker activity or it may be normal login or uh, system administrator activity. It just depends on what you're seeing. So, so again, that one's pretty straightforward could be run. Obviously, there's variations on this test as well. You could certainly go in and download uh, Daniel Bohannon's Invoke Obfuscation. There's, there's a couple of different Git repos that have different um, harnesses that you can use to download. And we could just see it's just going to be iterating through all the different components. Obviously, it would have been a good idea if I had piped that out to a text file, uh, just call it output or whatever. It doesn't matter, but you get the idea. So we're going to be enumerating all the different components on the machine, who's logged in, what processes are running, what information about the system. So an attacker may be testing to see, did they land in the sandbox, or are they sitting inside of an analyst uh, workstation that's looking at their uh, techniques or sample they've dropped? So, OK. And again, once, once I'm done with all these tests, I'll have a, a moment to pause for questions if some have come in. I'm, I'm guessing they probably have. So the next two tactics and techniques are going to be collection. And so here we're just simply simulating an attacker looking through the drive for any documents. Uh, obviously, they may be more um, selective in what they're looking for. But in this situation, we're going to look for anything that's a docx, and we're going to compress those into a file in the temp folder. And so pretty straightforward here. If you look, I've got a couple of different things in my folder here. I've got merger secrets. Uh, you know, we've got a couple other taxes and things, whatever's interesting to this particular attacker. Uh, and then using PowerShell, there's a command that you can use called compress archive. And what that allows the attacker to do will be to zip up the different components. Now that actually isn't a parameter on this, but I'll talk about that in a minute when Mike uh, goes into detection. But you you may catch an attacker if they're not using PowerShell, but using a RAR or another tool or 7-zip or something. They may actually catch some of their passwords on the command line potentially to see what they zipped up and what they encoded it with. So we simply run PowerShell. We call this compress archive command. And we actually then can see it's going to create a zip file. And then however the user decides to exfiltrate that data, we've got all the data's got zip right here. So that's the basic attack of those different techniques. So again, just to review, we, we start off enumerating user accounts. The next thing we move into is taking those user accounts, see what shares we can connect to. Then we enumerate any security software, download some more payloads to run discovery or enumeration, locate our targeted files, zip them up, and ship them off the network. So I've done a lot of talking at this point. I want to pause and make sure if there's any questions, Kia, let me know. We'll, I'll want to make sure I address those. So, Yeah, we do have a few questions that have come in um, okay, great. about QW Insta, okay. uh, whether or not it's a default 
binary, the protocols that it uses to talk remotely, um, as well as if it can get remote information without privileged domain admin access or authentication when it's talking to a remote system. Okay. Yeah, so some good questions there. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make sure I follow up after this webinar with information on the specific protocol that's being used for that. And I think the other question was around can it get uh, privileged information without being a member of the domain. I'll follow up with that one too. Uh, for now, I'm just running like on a Windows 7 non-domain joined machine and I'm targeting uh, the, the server, uh, server 2016 to see who's logged into that system. But I want to go back and make sure any configuration changes I made that may not maybe have affected that. So I will follow up with those. Those are a couple of good questions. Um, QWI and SDA is a default binary. So it's on at least on Windows 7 forward. So it would be something that you would want to build a baseline to see how often does that tool actually run and what attackers are using. I think if I remember right, it uses like DCE RPC to make the connection. But I'll follow up and make sure that that's the right protocol so you have that information. So good, those are really good questions. So thanks, Kia. Any other questions on what we went through there? Um, not right now at this uh, moment in the questions pane. Okay, okay great. Uh, okay. Awesome. So at this point, uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to switch gears. Now we've done a lot of different uh, detonation of attacks. We looked at some Q&A. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Mike to take you through, like, what does a defender actually see when all this activity is actually occurring? So at this point, let me make Mike the presenter. Cool. To start here, um, I'm going to kind of go down the same list of what Casey went through, every piece that he had executed, and talk about how we're going to look for that within Carbon Black Response. Uh, similarly, you can do the same types of queries uh, with like a Sysmon data source or like CrowdStrike or anything like that. Uh, or if you're using Elk or Splunk, all is pretty much similar. Uh, so in this case, um, Casey at the beginning kicked off a process during that chain reaction that goes through uh, looking for or using QW Insta to enumerate user accounts on remote machines. So with our demo environment, a simple thing to just baseline or understanding your organization is who's using QW Insta in my business. Um, I've seen it used on logon scripts. I've seen like system administrators querying their servers or terminal servers trying to understand who's logged in, if they're over capacity or whatnot. So in our particular case, within our demo environment, we have about 54 instances of it being used. That's a pretty solid baseline. Um, and so now within Carbon Black Response, I can click these and go through and see the command line. Okay, he's querying the, the local host on this particular one. Um, and in the demo, he was querying that server 2016 server. So similarly, I can see that here on this command line. Um, if I go in to actually analyze what he was executing, it begins to show a little bit more here in response. So I can now see, interesting, he was running a fine string here. Oh, he's looking for active or you know, disconnected endpoints on there. And then we also can go up one, up the chain on that command, uh, and actually see his full query looking there. And so there's a lot that we can pull out here. Um, I always recommend to organizations to baseline on these processes because they can either be very noisy or very quiet. And with Carbon Black Response, you can then, once you've built out uh, what this looks like in your organization, you, you understand how it's being used or not being used, you could then save even a simple query like this as a watch list and then track people using it. Uh, something as well that we track, or that we're also looking at too for this type of chain reaction um, is RWNSTA. And RWNSTA will actually reset a session on a remote machine. Um, you do need more ad admin privileges for that. So if you are seeing a lot of RW Insta activity across your environment, um, resetting remote machines, it could you know, do like a denial of service against a bunch of users out there. Uh, so similar to QW Insta, I could go off and reset a bunch of people. Uh, so if you mess with RW Insta, make sure you're doing it in a lab environment or an environment where you have permission to perform that. Um, and then the other one that's probably of interest, which you know I'm sure people thought of is Q Q user, uh, query user, and so in this case, just querying users. And with this process, these are all built in. So you are able to do Q user forward slash computer name, 
you're able to query that uh, for remote machines or even local machines. Um, so that's the first piece on how we can detect this. Um, once you get it tuned up, you could create a full one here with all of them in one, uh, looking for RWinsta and QWinsta all in one simple, simple uh, query. Save that as your watch list and then monitor and track that. Pretty simple. Hey, Mike, if I could Next, just interrupt real, real yeah. quick. Just, so yes, one thing I forgot to mention, and you may you may speak to it here, but what happens if an attacker renames that file? So what if they rename Q user to uh, CMD or something like that? Like this is pretty specific to the name of the process. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, great question. And, and that's obviously, you know, there's even instances where an actor will bring something into your environment, uh, whether it's command or even their own PowerShell or something. So in that case, with Carbon Black Response, we're able to query against um, the internal name of a process. So I can say internal name Q user, and that's with anything Q, uh, internal name PowerShell uh, across the board for all of these. And um, so it's actually a really solid test. We don't, I don't think we have much of this built into Atomic Red Team today for like renaming a process and then executing it. Do you know that, Casey? We don't know. I just, as, as we were going through it, I just thought it was a, something that may be interesting, uh, an interesting way to vary the attack. So we should definitely add something in there. That's cool. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I think there's a couple of frameworks out there that have that ability to rename and you could bring it in or whichever. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Yep. 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 Thank you. Um, so yeah, from there, Casey went off and performed some credential access slash lateral movement. He was accessing those um, Windows admin shares and using a brute force for loop there. So in this particular case, within his for loop, I'm gonna open up that chain reaction here. I have it open. I think I do, no, I guess I don't. Um, so that particular chain reaction was using net, um, net exe, and it was hitting IPC shares with different usernames and passwords. So in summer 2018, uh, winter, whatever it might be. And so in this particular case, a very simple carbon black response query would just be process name net command line IPC dollar. Um, you can obviously add in other ones in here if you want to track people hitting admin or whatever it may be, C dollar, um, just to add in some additional fidelity. Every organization is going to be different. There's a lot of admins who might use this. Um, for the demo environment here, we see our machines that have been hitting this pretty hard out there. So I see where Casey ran this. It was using net use against that server 2016 IPC, attempted to perform on that username and password. And we saw in Casey's demo where it actually authenticated using the same approach, um, which he received that echo response out saying that his was active. Another really good baselining one, right? Being able to go through, see who's hitting IPC across the organization or admin dollar or C dollar out there um, before you save this as a watch list. So from the next one that Casey performed, this was where he downloaded that discovery bat file and he did highlight as well what was in that bat file. So I brought it back up here again. In this case, it's performing pretty much anything and everything that MITRE has in here for discovery. And I added all these in here, it goes crazy. It generates so much noise. Um, if you happen to pull this down in your environment and execute it, it should hopefully ring some kind of bell. It doesn't have to be a red alert or you know people going crazy over it, but at least of interest that someone's querying user accounts locally, um, doing a bunch of reg, reg queries and whatnot. Um, so in this particular case, I didn't build out a whole lot of different types of detection for this. It just depends on the organization. I've seen organizations where they run system info and they do a, they do a fine string for the Windows version and they perform certain things based on that. So this could be very noisy, different organizations out there. Um, but it's very simple in Carbon Black. If you want to alert on someone running system info, you could save that as a watch list or a, a report in Splunk or whatnot or an Elk, um, even similar to Who Am I? There's so many things in here. It generates a lot of noise, um, whatever it may be. And so it just generates all this. From a perspective of collecting information, this is really simple and basic, right? You can execute this, and as Casey did, you can output that to a file. 
and then begin to parse through it, looking for something of interest. Um, in my case, I don't, I normally don't execute, or I normally don't uh, see many people executing all of these at once, right? It's more just a one or two system info, who am I, uh, maybe time, and that time, trying to understand the time, and then going from there, moving on, running ARP maybe. Um, anything else, Casey, to add to that one for discovery? No, I think that's good. I don't know if you could if you could show the. There's like a huge like what we call the CB oh, yeah. art, where it shows like, <laughs> you know, one process, <laughs> and then when you spawn this, you get you get a pretty good indication that this is. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's what I was thinking of. Just like just, I mean, from an analyst reviewing it, you can start to see all these child processes and file mods. Uh, it really starts to stand out. Uh, in uh, you know, as somebody looking at this, is is this normal or not? Uh, so yeah, that was the only other thing I thought I'd add there. Yep, awesome. Yeah, good point. So, so in this particular case, we have that PowerShell download of the discovery bat, and then you see all the child processes. And those are actually some pretty solid indicators. Um, monitoring those child processes coming off of PowerShell or Command, uh, or even Bash on Windows now, monitoring different child processes from those different things. And, that's where I think this really helps too in building out different types of detection criteria or different use cases for type data types. So you're able to say, hey, PowerShell spawning WMIC is generally not normal, uh, or net shell, that's kind of suspect what's going on, why is it spawning that, um, which is really neat. Even QW Insta, like you had performed in that other uh, alternate ending there, Casey. So moving up a little bit. Something that's probably not the most highest fidelity type of event uh, would be somebody querying and performing a task list or looking at uh, fine stream, looking for AV. This will be pretty low and slow, very similar to running system info. In this case, um, I just ran it just looking for that fine string CB. And if we drill into it again, you'll see the command line and then you'll see the full picture of what was executed. Um, so if you had received alert for someone running fine string, you would then see all these other interesting commands that had ran as well at that same point in time. Um, again, not the most highest fidelity, something you would want to alert on daily if someone running fine string, but it's definitely, you know, of interest out there if it's all executed at once. Yeah, I think it may be one of those things where looking at those patterns for the users to be like, how often is it run is a fine string run in conjunction or in the same velocity with all these other processes? So cool. Yep, absolutely. So a little bit back on that uh, that PowerShell download that Casey performed using invoke expression and um, downloading that discovery bat file. Um, in our environment here, most organizations have or an admin's running invoke expression or IEX. Um, in this case, we have quite a bit out there too in our demo. Uh, so I just ran the simple query of showing me PowerShell with either a command line of IEX or with the backslash um, <laughs> quote IEX ending there. So it's either or of those, and then it pulls up all these coming in, which then again show us all of the download strings that are occurring. This is a very good watch list to have. Um, in this case, for Carbon Black response customers, this is built into the Carbon Black advanced threat feed. So this comes down with it. Not to say that you could alert on everything from that feed, uh, but you can. And this is one of the ones that does come default with that. So you're able to see anybody running invoke expression out there, and it will alert on things just like this. That's built in. And then one of the last items that Casey performed, and I'll talk about the other one he did as well, uh, but the last one he performed was the zipping up of everything with PowerShell using Compress Archive. And so we see here just in the command line, this is very easy to look for, whether you're just looking for PowerShell process and then the command line Compress Archive um, and then all that zip. And then also you could go for those file mods that are occurring. And that's the other query that I had built out for this was actually looking for uh, file mods by command or PowerShell. Uh, the big thing is if you're looking for people mass zipping a lot of files, it may be happening more often than not. Uh, or if you're running it broadly against all your endpoints in Carbon Black Response, you'll catch servers moving things, your backup software, 
all those types of programs out there that are moving or even Chrome is really noisy. Um, and so what I ended up building for it was down here at the bottom, I'll talk about this in a second, uh, was just a file mod count one to 1000 for command or PowerShell. Very basic, but it's something to get you started in baselining what's doing what in your organization. Um, so just to kind of back it in there. So what we ended up publishing as well was along with the reactor uh, chain reaction is we wanted to at least show very basic ways you could go off and detect these in carbon black response. And I didn't bring in Sysmon or like using Splunk or Elk or anything like that. It's obviously very easy to convert these uh, for other products. So just very basic to baseline and then to actually save something to monitor. You will have to go through and tune these after you baseline. And so I gave you the baseline queries here. And then if you wanted to just save it right off the bat, you could just copy paste the monitor one and kick it off in there. Um, and it goes down the list for IPC. Everything I went through inside of Carbon Black is here as well. So it's not like nothing too crazy. And I saved some monitor ones in here for you. Um, get the PowerShell with netcon count. And this is under that discovery bat file one. Uh, reason why I did that was because we're looking for the IEX up here. But the one thing we didn't look for was PowerShell making a netcon. And you can convert that to any shell, right? Command, bash, um, any kind of other PowerShell instance and make it internal name if you want to detect someone bringing in PowerShell or somebody renaming PowerShell. And then that file mod count and then other instances of the uh, data compressed technique. So I added in all the different process names and then also monitor just for that compressed archive, very basic stuff. Um, you can see I added the Linux ones in here, unzip and tar. So you can at least go copy paste, throw it in your CB instance or look it up in Splunk or whatnot, see who's been running these baseline, uh, the amount of use going on out there. And then you could combine that with your file mod count and just to see how much file mods are being moved or being zipped. So kind of depending on the size of your organization, a quick way to query for all this information and not having to look in carbon black response to enumerate and understand the use of all of these or who's doing what out there. Uh, Red Canary has another tool. It's called CB Response Surveyor. Uh, use the carbon black API. It will go through and query carbon black, pull out all of your all the interesting processes that you want to look for. And in this particular case, it outputs it into just the standard CSV format. Uh, I always create a very generic pivot table just to kind of see what's going on out there. And you can see right here on these first couple lines, most everything of interest we want to look at. And so Q user, QW Insta, NetShell, PowerShell, everything. And the way we output everything with Surveyor is you will get the command line data. So now as you're baselining and you're trying to tune these watch lists and whatnot, you can go through each one of these, drill into them, you know, what's normal, what's evil that's happening out there, um, be able to enumerate what's kind of happening. So like in our instance, we don't have much Q user activity. It might be safe to save a Q user's watch list. Um, and then now you're able to see all your PowerShell execution out there. What are people doing? You know, I got someone recursing through directories here. Um, you know, that's maybe interesting. And people zipping up all the data. And then I have our QW Insta activity, uh, querying all these different machines. You know, that looks interesting. We're seeing, you know, computer two, five, four, three, just kind of going down the list of them all. So uh, that was a lot of information. I hope I didn't talk too fast, <laughs> but uh, I'll open that up for questions. <laughs> So we do have quite a few questions rolling in. Um, when you're building a detection capability for these recon activities, are there any best practices around looking for multiple threats on a single host? Um, yeah, so I kind of just start with going for showing me everything. Um, and if you have the ability to use Surveyor, I would just kick off a Surveyor right away to kind of see you know, what's going on in that simple machine. I think if you combine mo multiple of them into like a single query, the results are gonna look kind of skewed because you're gonna see a little bit of everything happening on that box. And that's where going into that process analysis page here, we'll kind of paint that picture a little bit better. Um, 
then you're able to kind of drill through and see it. But if you have the ability to use Surveyor, that's probably the fastest way to pull everything out, analyze it, even per computer, um, and see what's going on with that. Hope that makes sense, and hope that answers the question. Um, another question we have is, uh, would Carbon Black be able to capture modified binary names? And if so, is this done on hash? I could hey, probably take a you, stab at that. Yeah, yeah I'll take a stab view. at that. So I don't have it on my screen here, but um, there's a couple of different things that are collected about a binary. And so uh, there, are, there are attributes in a PE file like internal name or original name. Now, those are typically signed by the vendor that publishes that software. So if a, if, a, if a user breaks that and changes those internal names, uh, then, then the hash of the file would be an indicator that it's actually been broken. So that's, a, I think, I'm not sure if I answered that exactly, but you, you do collect, if you can see in Mike's screen there, when a, when a process executes, you do get the, the binary hash, the MD5 of that particular file, uh, and then you get additional attributes. I think if you, yeah, if you click on that, Mike, just maybe it might help answer the question there, like it can, so they can maybe yep. see some of the different attributes. Uh, that are collected about that particular binary, like how many systems have seen it, um, was it signed, who was the publisher. Um, so all of those are the different attributes. Anything in there, yeah, you can see down over on the right, you can see the original file name or internal name. That's what the vendor shipped that binary uh, with. And so those two things, hopefully that helps answer it. I'll, I'll go back through and make sure I write up a better answer and we'll do like a follow-up uh, on a blog or something to make sure we get all these answered. But yeah, you definitely would see that like the file has been tampered with because the hash would have changed. So you could compare like, okay, normally the hash for CMD in my environment is this, and I see CMD running and it's a variant, a variation of that. It's either the attacker brought that version or tampered with an existing version, if that makes sense. I think I covered that, but I'll, I'll make sure we write something yeah. out. Um, another question we have is, do you find that these IOCs are covered in the default threat feeds, or do you find it to be a good practice to explicitly call out these searches? I don't want to say it's going to be 50-50 on that. Um, so majority, majority of the more advanced ones will be pulled out into those feeds, but we probably won't see a generic like QW Insta or RW Insta added to the default feeds. Um, it's potential that some might be under like the user endpoint or just like the visibility feed that they have, like suspicious activity feed that they got. Um, but more generically, though, they, you'll probably have to go off and, and actually baseline your environment, you know, for these and then see what's going on. And you may never see a lot of these trigger, um, you know, just depends on the organization and, and how busy some of the tools are. But yeah, you may want to go off and create your own watch list. <laughs> Okay, another question. Uh, can you describe the process of tuning an item from the MITRE attack matrix into a high fidelity watch list? What kinds of things do you look to filter out and what kinds of things do you try to focus on? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll, I'll take uh, QW and or PowerShell encoded commands, for instance. Um, I worked at an organization where we had a lot of encoded commands being executed. Most of them were not evil. Uh, we had a lot of admins just doing it because it was simple for him to convert and just execute it all at one time type of deal, right? Um, so in that case, what I would do is ex export everything out into a CSV if you can, um, get, get all the data yourself and begin to look for those patterns of how many times he's executing or how many times a certain PowerShell encoded command is being used. Uh, and then either tune it out, it depends on the, you know, the business and what you're looking for specifically. If that admin's always doing it, you could tune it based on his username, if it's an admin account. Um, you could do it based on his computer name as well, if you want, which might be scarier. And so, but I would probably take the first few parts of his encoded command and just ignore that. So if he actually runs a different encoded command, I'll get alerted to his new one and then begin to tune it out based on that. Um, that was more in Splunk. It's a little bit trickier in Carbon Black response. You'll probably actually have to take the full encoded command and say ignore command line, um, which begins to get, get a little tricky and noisy that way and could have impact on performance over time. If you have 50 of them in there and you're trying to keep tuning it that, down that way. Um, whereas if you're tuning like a QW Insta, you might 
you might only have a couple instances where you can just say ignore a certain parent process name. So I don't want to look at parent process of agent.exe that's continuously spawning QW info because that's normal. Um, so you could wipe it out based on that and just kind of keep going down that list. Um, I try to get it down to where it's not executing 10 alerts every minute or every day. I only want a couple high fidelity alerts a week from a certain type of watch list or feed. Um, because if it's too noisy, I'm going to ignore it. If it's never noisy, it probably is not working or it's not tuned properly. So I need to keep reviewing it to make sure. Um, and if you have to review it more or less, I just run that query QW Insta without any tuning on it and just validate whether it's actually still working or not. Um, so it just, just kind of depends. It's all, it's all part of the tuning process is validating things are working or not. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we're getting a bunch of really good questions here. Um, if you're looking at QUser and the parent process is WSM prov host or when RM, you can't see the command line. Is there any way to see this data? Hmm. Yeah, that may be one we'll want to follow up on and see. That's a good question. So uh, we may not see the command line, but we may see like child procs is something that comes into mind on that one. So, um, yeah. So um, I think at this point, just for timing, um, we have a ton of questions that came in uh, that we're not going to be able to answer on the webinar. So what I think we're going to do is we'll we will follow up and, and, and list the questions and, and follow up with detailed answers because I think some really good interaction here, and you guys have asked a ton of, of really good questions. So I want to make sure we get all of those back out to you. So um, I think we're gonna. I'm gonna close out with a couple more slides, and then we'll wrap it up. But um, let me let me jump back in here real quick. So thank you. So, no, thank you, thank you, everybody. Great questions. Okay, so we should be back. So uh, really good interactive. I, I think we'll, we'll definitely do another one of these, and like I said, we'll get to the answers to these questions. Uh, in summary, everything we did today was in the GitHub repo, uh, reactor.batch file. So you're able to go in and see uh, that information there, uh, test it in your environment and see, and like Mike said, look at some of those tools like Surveyor, uh, get a baseline and see what's actually running and what the variations are in your environment. Okay, some things to kind of close out with, uh, always make sure you're testing and, and iterating. So don't ever get comfortable that, it, that just because you detected one thing one way, uh, adversaries are going to throw minor variations into your uh, environment to throw off your detections deliberately. Uh, we talked about renaming files as a very simple case study. So there's a lot of things you can do, but once you start dialing it in so you know you've got at least that base level, then you start introducing what Mike and I call like alternate endings or different ways to um, change the outcome of that. Customize for your environment or industry, and, and please share with us. The, the GitHub repo is open, so we'd love to have people writing different um, detections or even various chain reactions for us to key off of. So, so a couple additional resources. There's the GitHub link. There's also a page on redcanary.com, atomic-redteam, that has more information, consolidates a lot of the things we've been publishing about this, previous webinars, et cetera. Uh, check out our blog. I think we've got maybe two or three minutes for uh, a couple additional questions at this point to kind of wrap us up. So see if there's any other ones that came in there, Kia, to, to close us out. Um, yeah. How do you detect lateral moves with WMIC or DCOM that already happened? How would we detect WMIC or DCOM? Uh, I don't know that I can get into that right now. That's a good question. So those are going to be things that are going to look much, blend in, like the decom lateral movement comes to mind, for example, would be uh, something that blends in pretty well with normal activity. What I think we should do, Mike, is maybe we should build a, a, a test case for that uh, and send it into the range and just kind of see what that telemetry looks like. Because I don't, I don't think I have that prepared today to show, um, but that's a good question. The, the WIMIC stuff, too, Sometimes we can see child processes being spawned off of like WMI PR VSE, uh, but as far as lateral movement, we may need to look at net cons within the environment. But let, let me take that as a follow-up to get you additional information on DCOM and WMI lateral movement. It's a great, great uh, technique that we actually have seen. So cool. 
Thanks. I do, and it looks like there there are a bunch of really great questions. Um, I'm looking through them to find uh, the ones that we could do before we end here. Here's a question for you guys. Creating a demo environment for this, these techniques is sometimes a headache. Do you have a demo environment that can be downloaded? So we don't actually have a demo environment. Um, one of the things that we're exploring in the next phase of Atomic would be some things to, to build out an environment. But for now, we, we have the scripts, but it's really up to you to have a place to host and, and, and deliver those. Um, there's really no other requirement other than just a basic install uh, of Windows. A lot of these techniques use tools that are already built into the operating system. Uh, but at this point, we don't actually have any, any demo environment you could, could download. Um, but that's a good question. It's good feedback. We'll kind of see what the level of effort would be to build something like that. But uh, for now, all we have are the test cases that you can use. Okay, cool. I think, um, I think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I think one of the, the easiest things that recently came out was from Chris Long. He created a detections lab, a detection lab. Uh, that, that might be the fastest way to build a test environment, and that will produce a, a domain, a domain controller. Um, you know, you get a Windows 10 machine with Windows event forwarding all set up and everything like that. Uh, that might be the fastest way to build a lab today. Um, he also just integrated Caldera into it for MITRE, so you have the options to deploy too. Yeah, we should get that. I just made a note to get that link out to Chris's lab build. I think he was using Terraform or something to stand up some of those systems, so it's perfect. Yep, Vagrant. I think it was Vagrant. Yeah. Vagrant. Okay, yep. there you go. That'd be awesome. Yep. Okay. Oh, we have five more minutes. Okay, I guess we can take another couple questions. We still have a few more minutes. I thought we were. Uh, wrapping up, sorry. <laughs> okay, here's another question. Uh, are there are there other techniques to enumerate accounts or servers? Yeah, so there's a couple of the different things here. Like we were using the QW Insta technique. Um, there, like think of a tool like Bloodhound. Uh, that, that's a PowerShell tool. That's uh, or, or C sharp tool. There's a couple of different ways to run Bloodhound, but it's it, it would be another way to enumerate not only accounts, but which systems users are logged into to move through the environment. So that would that would be another way, uh, simply leveraging uh, Active Directory or using SPN scanning. So let's say you wanted to look for all the SQL servers in your environment, you could use a, a technique like SPN scanning to, to to find that information in Active Directory. Uh, and so, so there's certainly a number of different ways or techniques that attackers can use to enumerate accounts. Those are a couple that come up uh, uh, the top of my head right off the bat. I don't know, Mike, if you have other thoughts on that. Uh, I was just going to mention we do have a, uh, under our, under Atomic Red Team uh, execution PowerShell, we do have a Bloodhound um, download PowerShell line in there. You just copy paste that and that'll download it and execute it. Um, and also, I believe it's in one of the other chain reactions that's actually in there too. Um, so it's, you could just pull that chain reaction down. It's one of the discovery ones. You'll notice it's really focused on discovery and pull that down. It'll run Bloodhound or I think, yeah, I think it's Bloodhound for sure. <laughs> uh, can we take another question? Yeah, yeah think, absolutely. Uh, yep, we're good. Yep. Do you have any recommendations to build assets that fit a tax framework? I think it's MITRE tax framework. Oh, that's a good question. We don't have anything that, I mean, the, the, so the MITRE attack framework it has techniques for both Linux, Windows, and Mac. And so mm -hmm. we don't have anything that allows you to, like, we were really focused on the tests, not necessarily like the infrastructure, if that makes sense. Um, so that, that's, that's it's good feedback, but at this point, I think like uh, Mike mentioned, we'll have some references for, to some other uh, people that have done some work in creating like the infrastructure that would map to like what MITRE is actually testing. The, the, I haven't looked, uh, if I don't remember if the Caldera framework has that, you, you may check that out as well. That's actually MITRE's testing framework as well. You may check that out and see if that has some more robust host building and uh, configuration items too. I don't know if that answered the question, but I, I just make a note to follow up for sure. 
Okay, cool. Uh, and it looks like we're pretty close to time. Thank you all for attending today and thanks also for all of the great questions. Um, if we didn't address your question during the webinar, we will definitely follow up afterwards. Uh, once again, a recording and recap of today's presentation will be sent out in the next few days. Um, thanks once again for joining us and um, we'll be talking to you soon.